Hello everyone, Eid Mubarak. I'm Radhika, and on behalf of DC South Asian Arts Council, Inc., a nonprofit 501c3 organization, I'd like to welcome you all to our first literary festival that started on May 9th and will continue till May 15th. Thank you for registering with us. We hope you enjoyed the session so far and found them valuable. Before we start with today's panel, I'd like to take a moment to express the support and concern for the tough times everyone is going through due to COVID pandemic. Our prayers and thoughts are with you. As we all know how tragic the situation is in India due to COVID-19, we have decided to help them and further our cause by encouraging everyone to donate. Our website, www.dcsaaci.org, has a donation button and all the donations which we collect during DC South Asian Literary Festival will go towards COVID relief. A deep appreciation for everyone and for all the healthline workers, the doctors, the nurses who have risked their lives in taking care of others. A big thanks to all our speakers, moderators, hosts, sponsors, and audience for supporting the festival. We could not have pulled together such an exciting and engaging event without you. Today's panel focuses on reviving Jules Verne's famous protagonist in the new science fiction novel, Nemo. The panel is moderated by Mimi Mondal. Mimi is an Indian speculative fiction writer based in New York. She was a Nebula Award finalist in 2020 for her novelette, His Footsteps Through Darkness and Light, and a Locus Award winner and Hugo and British Fantasy Awards finalist in 2018 for her anthology, Luminescent Threads, Connections to Octavia Bertleran, 2018. Mimi grew up in Kolkata and currently lives in New York. Everyone, please welcome Miss Mimi Mondal. Thank you, Radhika, for that very gracious introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Once again, on the behalf of the DC South Asian Arts Council, thank you for joining us tonight at the inaugural DC South Asian Literary Festival. I'm really excited for tonight's panel, and so I hope so are you. Before we start, I want to take a moment to thank the healthcare and frontline workers, both in the US and back home in our countries in South Asia, who have been working relentlessly and for more than a year by now to keep us safe through this raging pandemic. Um, today's panel, as some of you know, is about an upcoming podcast show called Nemo. And Nemo is primarily a story about colonization and its repercussions. So although we're doing this event online, I'd like to include an acknowledgement of the original colonization of the land that we're sitting on. Like today, we call the United States a land of immigrants. And many of us here on the panel are immigrants. But before any of us or our ancestors arrived here, this was the land of the Native American people many of whom were driven from their homelands for, to make space for what's called United States. So New York City, where I am speaking from, sits upon the ancestral land of the Lenny Lenape people. And Washington DC, where this festival is organized, exists on the ancestral land of the Nakotstak Tank people. And on that note, I will start introducing our panelists of tonight. Mm. Achala Upendran's first book, The Sultanpur Chronicles, Shadowed City, published by Hachette India in 2018, is an epic fantasy set in South Asian mythos. She is currently based in Los Angeles. Hi, Achala. Um, Samit Basu is an Indian novelist and filmmaker. His latest novel, Chosen Spirits, was shortlisted for the JCB Prize. Samit has published several novels since 2003, including the Game World Fantasy Trilogy and the Turbulent series. Several of his books have been published internationally and have been bestsellers in India. Hi, Samit. And Shiv Ramdas is an Indian writer. His short speculative fiction has appeared in publications like Strange Horizons, Fireside, Podcastle, and others, and has been nominated for the Nebula, Hugo, and Ignite Awards. He currently lives and works in Seattle. You can find out more about him at shivramdas.net or finding tweeting at nameshiv. Hi, Shiv. 
So now that we're all here, I will start with an introduction of what tonight's panel is about. Um, many of you have heard of the character called Captain Nemo, who was technically the antagonist, the villain, in the novel 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Joel Verne. And uh, so 20,000 Leagues was originally a French novel, but most of us in India, at least, have read it in English. And many of us read it in our childhood or teens. Um, so the interesting thing about Captain Nemo to most of us Indian and South Asian readers had been that he was apparently an Indian prince and a descendant of Tipu Sultan. And 20,000 Leagues is a novel from the 19th century, from long before Indian literature in English had really taken off. So you could rarely find an Indian character in English or Western literature. So the character of Captain Nemo was later adapted by British writer Alan Moore in his The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and in the 2003 film adaptation of The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, um, Captain Nemo was played by Nasiruddin Shah. So it's always been common knowledge that Captain Nemo was Indian, but there has never been a really strong backstory to him. And he's supposed to be a mysterious character in all, all these depictions. So that is something where the four of us are doing in this new production called Nemo. We are writing a backstory of Captain Nemo tracing his life prior to the events of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And it's coming out later this year, possibly in September, from Realm FM. So I want to say a few words about Realm, which was previously known as Serial Box. Realm is a podcast studio and publisher. So the stories, the productions from Realm, Nemo, and also many other works by many other well-known science fiction and fantasy writers are available to listen on most podcast services. So iTunes, Spotify, whatever you subscribe to, or you can also subscribe to Realm's own app at www.realm.fm. So on that note, I'll start asking some questions to my panelists and friends. So the first question, um, how did each of you come on board to into this writing team for Nemo? Let's talk a little about the beginning of the project. So I'm going to ask Samit because Samit is the lead writer on the team. Hi, you know, um, hi, it's so good to see all of you guys. It's uh, what six thirty-eight a.m. here, which of course is not peak functioning time for any writer that I know of. Um, so, apart from apologizing for um, kind of mumbling and muttering, which I'm going to do, um, I want to kind of also apologize in advance because the internet connection here has been very patchy for a while. So if I disappear. Um, at any point of time, it is not me making a, a personal or political statement. It is just the internet. Um, uh, everyone, everyone else is is here is in various uh, civilized parts of the world, all inside the U.S. Um, here, however, we uh, I am in the middle of what is normally a fairly chaotic situation. But currently, I'm sure everyone who's watching this is following the news. We we are in the middle of complete kind of societal and governmental and systemic collapse, I say with a big smile. Anyway, that's not what you asked me, Mimi. And um, again, here- No, I'm glad you said that though. Yeah, because I, I, I was almost afraid of asking everybody on screen how you're doing, because that is not good news. Yes, yes. So, I mean, this is, this is I'm trying, I'm, this is a sort of, I'm trying to maintain that kind of very cheery mid-apocalypse uh, tone that that uh, is all the rage here in in Delhi and all over India right now. Where uh, anyway, so how did we how did how did we come into this this lovely Nemo project? Um, so for me, it was uh, Marco Pamieri, who is the is the head producer at Realm, I think, um, who who suddenly appeared in my inbox out of nowhere with a mysterious summons, which was appropriate, I thought, for a project where even both in, in the, 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 the inside the story, it's also very full of mysterious summons, as was the original text. Fortunately, there was less almost drowning and sea monsters in, in the, in the build-up to this project. Um, so, you know, as someone who's been doing um, sort of cross-media work for several years now, the the prospect of of uh, doing work that um, now it's now it's going to be a podcast centric thing. Uh, Serial Box's earlier model was that simultaneous text and audio, and the, and I'm sure I'm sure it, it's that aspect will still remain. Um, so the prospect of doing doing cross media, interesting work, collaborative work, um, and cross continental work, which which this turned out to be, was these opportunities are not super common. 
um and um, so you know the prospect of working with a team of far away a but familiar and very exciting writers such as your fine selves was a very attractive one and um the story was i mean you know um i don't know it, i i actually want to know when 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 all of you speak about this where you first encountered uh, 20000 leagues because i don't think any of you waited until the kung fu nasiruddin shah version of 2003 i'm sure most of you encountered it in some other media in some other form for me it was i don't know uh, again i'm since i'm significantly older than some of you and fairly older than all of you i, I don't uh, think it's significantly older that that means something else fair enough but uh the there was i don't know whether you, for me it was moby books i don't know if you guys had moby books which were these really small abridged uh illustrated versions of classic stories um which enabled my entire generation to pretend that we had read a great many uh classic stories that we fortunately missed out on the very boring experiences of reading in full so um 20000 leagues for me was one of those it was it was uh, uh you know really nice illustrations on the left very small book a uh, big font um supreme abridgments on the right um but it was one of the ones that i found exciting enough to actually read the the original text after but my my image of um, the the first impression of all of these uh, characters was for, set in stone by those very classic style illustrations of the moby book so it was a very pleasant surprise to me to find much later that nemo was an indian character i actually re- i i had not read the mysterious island where where verne revealed this um, at a point where i think saw in the alan moore comics where where nemo was a seek and i was like oh what an interesting exciting uh, take on nemo then i looked it up and no he's indian apparently so yeah that was end of ramble number 1 for me uh, <laughs> i will hand back to you so i i will ask the question to achila how did you come into the project and how did you come to nemo uh, as a character in which work Sure. Um so how did I come into the project primarily because of Samit. He reached out when he was staffing up his crew and I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, I've always wanted to work with him because he's a writer I really admire. Um his book, The Samokan Prophecies, was what kind of showed me that it's possible to write fantasy in an Indian voice and have it be fun and enjoyable um and all the great things like Tolkien but also really funny. um and not take itself too seriously so any opportunity to work with him and i was like yeah sure sign me up um i came to nemo through i remember i had these like illustrated versions of books they were like super probably condensed versions of classics kind of laid out in a very proto graphic novel form um i had that for like the count of monte cristo and a couple of other of these like classics and 20000 leagues is one of them so i haven't actually read the core text i read that and then i did encounter nasiruddin shah in a uh, league of extraordinary gentlemen and thought he was very cool <laughs> along with dorian gray who was my fascination at that time um and continues to be because you know dorian gray is amazing um so that that's how i came to it and i've always loved like adventure stories and fantasy stories so it felt like a very natural segue to like move into this kind of writing and like some had said like writing for a podcast is new but i love like one of the, my favorite parts of writing is really dialogue and character interactions and i feel like podcasts kind of give you a new way to look at those cuz you're thinking of how someone's going to perform this dialogue right instead of just reading it um so that's like been a fun thing to incorporate into my work on this particular project so i i want shiv's questions like shiv's answers on the same question so my story is pretty much similar to some it's like i woke up one morning and i found an email from marco in my inbox and so the thing is like i should probably answer this the other way around like because I like I told Marco like the moment I saw the word Nemo in the email I was in because this has been one of my favorite characters since I was a kid like Samit I found him through the Mobies and then what happened was I enjoyed it very much and then I ended up at this family relatives place for one summer holiday or something who had a massive library with books that were only in Gurmukhi and therefore unreadable 
one English book, which was the unabridged 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So I read that book about 15 times in that summer holiday because there was no other book. So that was my initial introduction to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Like Samit, I did not know he was an Indian because that was never revealed till the mysterious island, which I came across much later in life. Like I think I was finished with college when I first came across it. So my love for Nemo almost predates my realization of him as someone who represents my identity, which basically was like, it's like, you know, you feel, fall in love with someone and then 20 years later, you realize you have a whole new set of reasons to love them, which was quite cool. So, so this is this is this is fun because I never found those abridged versions. Like I I read it from the Wordsworth classics books, so it was unabridged, and I was reading it as a child. So I skipped all the you know world building details, and so I guess that's why I didn't really pick him up very well as a character. I barely read the story, but I skipped all the long descriptive paragraphs, of which there are many. It's not the worst way, like as we've kept mentioning that you know league of extraordinary gentlemen film like like i feel like i don't know how it's possible to love nemo if you encounter him first in that film because that film is basically nemo is like submarine uber right his job is to get the <laughs> from point a to point b and that's pretty much what he does in that film okay did you guys not read the comic book before the movie i mean i i thought the movie was kind of unimpressive but the comic i i like the comic books more much more Oh, definitely read the comic book and it was, no, for the movie, you know, it was just that it was Nasiruddin Shah, right? So there's a, I think most of us would give him a very, very wide range of things of, you know, terribleness that he could do before we allowed ourselves to not love anything that he did. At least that, that was where I came into it. And um, yes, that movie was, um, as we, as we say in the, in, the, in academic terms, a hot mess, but <laughs> doing kung fu spin kicks while somebody else turned into a vampire and everyone kind of you know ran this silver car over cobbled streets it was it was nice <laughs> it worked <laughs> i mean this this reminds me this was also around the time so the movie was 2003 and that was just around the time like hollywood was beginning to hire like international authors Sorry, international actors in their projects. So they would pick all these like really good actors from other countries who have a great portfolio of very good acting and give them stupid roles. So and, and that that is something I remember. You you summed it up. Like imagine getting a man of Nasiruddin Shah's talents and making him do that. Like whoever did that bit of writing for that character should be sued. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna venture a controversial take and say that. Okay. It must have been super fun for him to do because like those kind of big franchise films didn't really exist in Bollywood at that point. And, you know, that's it is an experience to be part of some sort of huge media enterprise like that and be working with like Sean Connery, you know, like that's James Bond. <laughs> so I feel like part of my fascination for him in that movie was like, like one of you pointed out, um, it was the first time like seeing a big Bollywood star on an American or is it British project. Um, and like seeing him in the company of people like that, like to show that, oh, we can also go out and have fun and do these like cool Indiana Jones type films, which let's be honest, we need more of in Bollywood. That, that's just my subtle pitch for like screenwriting of some kind. I mean, I, I just saw a comment from Tade Thompson where he says the film made Sean Connery retire from films, though. <laughs> so, okay. Um, okay, now I, I my next question is... Uh, it was not, not the worst thing that could have happened at that point because he was already kind of playing the same character <laughs> across every single thing that he was doing. Um, and the thing is, you know, Nasiruddin Shah is also famously grouchy when it comes to being in things so it was it was interesting i think when we saw the casting for that movie knowing that they had assembled a cast which actually could have done justice to a really good interpretation of the comic in the sense that all the actors there had the requisite gravitas to to go for that completely for that scale of complexity and insanity which the comic had so to then find this strange i mean it was in its way a, a run up to that other recent epic uh, adaptation that was Cats. Um, oh. 
<laughs> what, what kind of thesis sentence is that, Samit? Which similarly took material you were expecting to go in a certain way and took it to a very different place. And I'm glad for Nasiruddin Shah that he got to be in this experience and that he got to watch Sean Connery's will to act end. Um, <laughs> and it did not. It did not in the process end his own will to act because he continues to 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 be amazing. Sorry, I'm digressing. The other thing I feel like I mean this movie did was I guess like it actually showed a lot of international audiences and also probably a lot of Indian audiences because I don't know how many Indians read Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, but a lot of people actually noticed that there was an Indian character in there, which I I guess not many people knew. Like yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so I I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that movie was like you know started a process that's ending up in us writing this project for like an international publisher, like with an Indian author team, and we're expecting that an American readership, not just an Indian readership, will also read it and they will recognize that there was an Indian character in that international novel. So I guess like that kind of recognition may have come from the movie, I don't know. I mean, it's always possible, but I genuinely like, you know, in terms of in terms of kind of um, classics that can be reinterpreted or in this case, prequeled in a sense, um, that have Indian characters in them that are not presented in a completely horrifyingly racist way. Um, is very rare. I think it's a, it's a, it's a subset that kind of boils down possibly to this. Um, and so, in terms of of so, I mean, again, I don't know. I don't know what the inception of this project was because by the time it by the time I started work on it, there already was an outline, and uh, the the one that we worked with was a modification of that. So I had actually thought that you were involved with that previous outline, maybe. So. I, I was. I, I had looked at Marco's outline because so Marco Palmieri, for those who don't know, was also my editor at Tour.com. So, um, like, it, this was almost a couple of years ago where Marco, when he had just moved from Tour to Serial Box, he was um, starting a few new projects, a few new productions. And he told me that I would be interested in doing like an Indian project with Captain Nemo because Captain Nemo is a recognizable character. So like Serial Box does a lot of adaptations or, you know, continuations, prequels, et cetera, of like well-known franchises. So this is technically a well-known franchise, although it's no longer copyrighted, right? And so, yeah, so he had talked about certain parts of history, like which, which nuances of history we could use in this novel. And then he, he wrote the, original character idea though so i had i had looked at it but yeah like i i hadn't really contributed in the pilot so but i i, I had heard about that so yeah so one of my other questions is so what part of the project like so far what we've written what part has been the most fun for you what did you really enjoy writing mm, achala so so far like i mentioned in my first ramble as some have called it um I really enjoy writing characters and like specifically like smaller moments that lead to like potential larger changes in the narrative and I was lucky enough to get one of those episodes that's really just like a character piece. Um, so that's that's what I've enjoyed getting into like just focusing on like someone who's usually such a dynamic character like Nemo who's always like going out and doing things and like attacking people or saving people. Um, sort of narrowing in on like what do you do when there's nothing to do apart from sit with somebody maybe somebody you like lost touch with a while ago no spoilers um and then reconnect as people um so just kind of focusing on the the human in Nemo and not the myth yeah um Shiv what did you enjoy writing the most well, I got to do a lot of character and early setting and origin story is always fun. But so the one thing about Nemo I've always found particularly fascinating is everybody else around him who worked with him, especially in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Like on one hand, you have this person who's extremely obsessed and driven with this almost apocalyptic vision of what he's going to do with the rest of his life, which is one thing. Because he keeps hinting at he has, you know, experienced these things and he has these reasons. And basically what's happened to him in his life is the reason all this Nautilus stuff is happening. 
But then you've got an entire crew on the Nautilus who are willing to follow this man to the ends of the earth in their lives. And we never really know why. And so one of the things I actually got to do during the writing of this was work on an episode where I got to explore Nemo's relationship with his crew and, you know, why someone would follow someone like this in a journey like this. And that was really a very fascinating thing for me to do because I've always been very, very interested in Nemo's relationship with his people. Samit, what did you enjoy the most? Um, well, I, I like jumping across genres in any case, right? And this was this was something where um, this was not a space that I've worked in a lot before. So it was it that was interesting to do. Um, for me, though, while of course, you know, the, the story is fascinating, the, the spin we're doing on it is also something that I actually am really enjoying. And it, it's it's um for me the, the best part of it though is this collaborative aspect because you know especially if you're if you're a prose centric writer from india um you don't really get to um experience this kind of multimedia collaborative around the world around the clock sort of thing where people with different voices come in and everyone's doing, you know, every and writers are, are much more like cats than like dogs. So everyone's wandering off in their own directions. And, you know, and then through all of it, something comes together that is hopefully, and, hope, and we don't want to kind of uh, hype this too much, uh, that is hopefully more than the sum of its individual parts, but also contains voices that you, you know, voice variations that you would not have if, if one person were doing the whole thing. So as prose first writers, which I think all of us here are, um, it's pretty rare that you get to work on these collaborative projects. And that is something that I that was one of the prime attractors for me to this thing, because, um, you know, as, as all of you are aware, if you're doing something in any of these supposedly creative lines of work, coming from India, you're anyway doing something that is fairly unconventional and that people find confusing. Um, so you generally end up with an atmosphere where, you know, collaboration is far rarer than intrigue, shall we say, or people kind of really fighting hard for small slots of attention. So we don't get to do a lot of the creatively interesting aspects of work that people from more, shall we say, mature creative spaces get to do. So getting to do this in the first place, um, doing it in a year where, of course, you know, of course, the pandemic was and continues to be a very terrible thing. But in terms of what it's managed to do in, in creating interesting opportunities for people to work over the internet where previously they would not have been able to work over the internet. Um, so, you know, earlier, even if, if this project were happening, it would have, it would have, uh, they'd have had to find, I guess, four writers based in New York or nearby to do it. So that we're in four different cities, three different time zones, and we were able to kind of coordinate and get it get it done as far as we have so far and we'll finish it is is something that I that uh, was really exciting because it, it's 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 been fun. I mean that is something I remember from my conversations with Marco like a uh, couple of years ago when he was um starting this project because uh realm which was serial box back at that time uh serial box used to have in-person writing rooms and the in-person writing room used to happen in new york and so far they had largely used authors who were based in america so they they would like you know bring those authors in and those authors would sit in new york for three or four days and they would do live writing rooms and uh for this project like at that time like marco had really wondered about whether he could find the right people to write it in America, because this, like as as we all we all know, so I'm just saying this for the audience's benefit, I guess that this this goes pretty deep in Indian history, and I, I guess this kind of presumes being written by people who studied Indian history in school, right? And. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I don't know if this project would have actually taken off if the pandemic didn't happen. Terrible as that sounds, like this is this is one of those, you know, working environments that expanded because of the pandemic, and it like it it went on to, you know, bigger opportunities, I guess. Mm. 
so i mean one of my other questions was uh, is something that we've already some of us have talked about um like how has the experience of collaborative writing if it has if it, has it changed your original writing like has it enhanced your original writing have you faced um difficulties or so on so um i'll start with achila again well it's been it's been interesting because i i mean i've only written one book so i only have that to measure this against and um when i did that i so as a writer i tend to just like go in with no set agenda or even outline like i have a vague idea of maybe the characters but that's it um and this was so different because like since we're all working together you can't just like jump in and just do whatever the hell you want right like we had like a, a set outline and like even just meeting to work out like what happens in each episode was it's very different from what i was used to um so just writing to a plan i think has been like a really interesting lesson for me um that creative writing can happen in those kind of like mapped out spaces and i think that's like a great skill set to take away from this experience and i really think that collaborating is what led to that development what about chief so i used to work in advertising and radio so i've done a bunch of collaborative writing projects especially one that worked with soundscapes in the past so for me it's been more like a very interestingly pleasant revisiting of how similar it is to writing in other spaces like those like the soundscaping is very similar to writing like radio episodes and plays like we used to do and in both radio and advertising you tend to do a lot of collaborative work as well like a lot of your a lot of your output depends on what other people are inputting as well and you need to be able to find ways in which you can be individually creative within a larger structure so it's it's actually been very fascinating in how similar it is in a lot of ways to writing in creative fields that are not purely fiction and prose I mean I mean so you because you brought up the soundscapes I want you to talk a little about that because I think among us you have been the most excited about the sounds that go into the event like go into the podcast because the sounds do go into the podcast so there are there will be a reader reading out the stories but there will be small sounds to like you know add add to the environment and like Shiv has been very interested about that so let's let's hear a little about what what you think about like well, how are you engaging with the soundscapes as you're writing like do you write with sounds in mind do you do you write places where people can put in sounds like do you do you leave spaces for that when you're writing well both because so so i'm a radio person like i've spent many years like writing on radio speaking on radio and stuff like that so writing with an audio scape in mind essentially is almost how i learned to write in a lot of ways professionally So one of the things you have to do when you're writing in radio is you have to understand that you know it is a purely audio medium. So a lot of your like when you're doing say episodic radio and fiction on radio a lot of the stuff you're doing is when you're writing you're thinking about stuff like background and beds and the ways in which your words and what is in the front scape of what you're writing you know like the dialogue or the what is happening the actual narrative so and so lifted his arm and that stuff what you can do behind that to sort of reinforce it without overwhelming it it's a fairly subtle line and it's really fun to do. for me at least especially it's really fun to do because it's almost like it's as close as you get to writing a film without ever writing a film awesome so i i wanted to ask samit i mean you have also written for comics and tv right so you have not just written fiction and and how how does this fit among all the other formats that you've written it's a it's a very interesting format because yeah i've written i've written collaboratively uh both kind of um with other writers and you know with with every all the 300 other people who are involved in collaboration on a film um so it it's interesting because you know uh, most of the other media like comics or or film and therefore tv or you know i'm sure and i'm sure this applies to um writing for audio and writing for advertising as well um a lot of these media have the the collaborative aspect kind of baked into the into the process of uh, of writing itself because um and so with prose it's so much you're so much more accustomed to it being a purely individual uh process and of taking on that responsibility for 
doing every aspect of the storytelling, taking on that you know burden, challenge, fun, whatever whatever aspect excites you most, of taking all of that on yourself and just you know handling the environment, the mood, the tone, the back the backstory, all of it, all of it by yourself. So so prose is actually the one of all of these media that is not inherently built for collaborative work. It's kind of inherently built for um, finding and expressing a particular voice that is your voice. So in that sense, this kind of this kind of collaboration is very fascinating because it is um, bringing these voices together in a medium that is somehow designed for individual expression and not for kind of, you know, meshing together inherently like comics are or like film is. It's it's interesting. It's something that I certainly would want to explore doing more. But um, you know, the the kind of the pinnacle of collaborative prose writing, I would for me at least, has been say Good Omens by by Terry Pratchett and, and Neil Gaiman. But there, it's a situation where you have authors who have clearly been friends for at least two hundred years, um, or formally whatever in their human forms they declared their friendship. Uh, to be off uh, before writing uh, this book, uh, but to have people who have not hung out as a group uh, in real life, uh, kind of airdropped in, or in this case, submarined into a location where they have to kind of pull off this heist using tools that are not customized for the pulling off of said heist. Um, it's it's. I, I thought that was that was really interesting. You know, one of the things that interested me about this project is that this is precisely the kind of novel I would not have been able to write by myself. And I really like these fast paced heist kind of novels. And I that is not a skill set that I have at all. So um, I, I was really enjoying how. Um, so once again, for the audience in Serial Box in Realm, each of us write one chapter. Like we write more than one chapter, but a single chapter is written by one person. After we have, um, like, we have our writers' room, which were in this case our writers' Zoom, and we had our conversations about. I had to make a bad pun. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so we uh, we all talked about what's going into the novel, and then we discussed what's going into each um, each chapter. And then each of us went off to write our chapters by ourselves. Like we were given certain chapter assignments and we went off to write them. And in the process of writing them, because we were like, we maybe took away like three or four line descriptions of this part of the story happens in this chapter. But then when you're writing it by yourself, you're bringing in a lot of your own touches, like whatever you're good at, like your, your end of the chapter ends up getting, you know, an excess of that. So clearly, I mean, when I read like, you know, Shiv's and Samit's chapters, I haven't yet read Chachala's chapter, but so I looked at them and I was like, this is a treatment very different from if I had written this chapter, this treatment would not have been there. And I think that is really, really enhancing the novel in a way that like all of us are very different kinds of writers. And somehow it's like creating a more rounded product than if any of us had singly written this. Mm. So I, I also wanted to ask Sami the question about um, since you've worked uh, in India more or less so far, right? Um, like Shiv and I have written short fiction at least for aiming towards the international audiences, right? We are we had written in like American magazines. Um, so do you, despite this being an Indian writers' room, this is also an American production and. Uh, what perspective differences did you find? Like, what 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 is the difference in framing that you found? Um, well, see, the I've had two novels out in America so far, and one more coming next year. And uh, the comics have also they were for an American company, and you know the editor was ex Marvel and so on. So, I think you know in terms of in terms of uh, what the differences were between working on American projects versus working on Indian projects is that, I mean, there is a certain, you know, there is a certain post-internet singularity of culture, shall we say, that mm -hmm. that allows all of us to uh, 
build communication bridges with people from anywhere in the world because there are certain language um unifiers that everyone has now i think every, i mean especially for people who are who are genuinely young nowadays i think they can just seamlessly fit into into kind of cultural conversations with each other where they immediately identify you know what types they are and what they like and don't like about each other very quickly without having to go through that that bridge of 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 you know spending a lot of time uh, figuring out who the other person is um so it's actually the the kind of post internet singularity international work project is a is a very fun and fairly seamlessly easy thing to do like i I've, i've had far more um cultural differences let's say working in bollywood um then i have had on any international project um because there is a there is a certain there is a certain common language spoken that is kind of the language of say international publishing which is the same when you are when when i'm publishing in the uk or in the us or in india there is much more of a common of common ground between the the languages and processes and even the personality types um involved in that then there is in working say cross media in india so so the, the overlap between a bollywood project and a kind of penguin books or novel publishing process there is very little um these are worlds that do not intersect with each other even inside india so right. um so so the people the the processes the conversations are 100% not the same um similarly like the new age comics company and i think this would this, there would be a significant overlap with other new media companies anywhere in the world that is probably the closest to working in a in a kind of corporate startup that i'm ever going to get because the jargon is entirely corporate which is not what it is like in publishing or in films so i think that's the part of the 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 being a creative in these times in the post broadband uh, possible uh, you know multimedia possible multi genre universe that we now live in it's uh, it's exciting because it it's creating a, a a new language where just like we have technology where you you know where you don't have to learn entire sets of skills and you can just kind of plug and play yourself into the project whatever it is um culturally also there is there is a there is a uniformity which we which we see on say twitter or on or any other social uh medium when we are on there um we are actually able to talk to people from anywhere in the world and there isn't that what used to be there in the 90s or the noughties about that first long period where you explain that you do not in fact have any elephants unless you guys do have uh, elephants um or you know all those other things where we know three things about india and those are the things we will discuss with you for the longest time that that the death of that has been a, a great comfort and i mean all of us we are pretty much the same generation i'm not accepting that some it is substantially older but we we did live through that period though i mean the thing about samit is that okay achala and i are probably the same school class so we are the same age and samit's books came out when we were the like samit's first books came out when we were in high school and that makes him sound substantially older except he was 22 years old so that that is the that that is actually the division that that is the math so you're not actually that that much older than us you just published really young so i, I this without comment or argument <laughs> but so, do go um, yeah i i wanted to hear also from like shiv and achala because i mean ours was probably the generation that actually grew up through that you know the thing that you that you said about people thought new three things about india and they wanted us to write about elephants right like our later generation will probably not grow, grow through that and uh, like how has your writing changed like in this changing landscape like achilla um by changing landscape do you mean like media landscape Political um landscape? readers readers expectation as well because we as like science fiction fantasy writers from south asia we're still a pretty new genre right and um now that we're coming into like you know even in america or the west like they keep thinking that south asian science fiction fantasy is like 5 years old and it's not like at least we are not 5 years old so how has your writing changed in like greater acceptance of your um, i don't i don't really know like 
I feel like it's too soon to tell for me since it's just been one. And um, that book, I literally just wrote what I would have wanted to read when I was like younger. Um, like I said, I don't go in with like a plan or an outline. It just sort of happened. Um, I, I, I mean, I've definitely become more like aware of certain like currents or expectations now, like after that experience. So I would, yeah, I probably would now position like anything I write in slightly more um, aware of that kind of cross cultural context light. I don't know if I would write something just because people expect to see something because like, like I keep stressing, I don't know what I'm gonna write when I sit down and write. Um, but yeah, I think there's like a little more savvy in terms of like, how would I market this to somebody who did not grow up with the same experience? Um, so for instance, like the next thing I'm working on is slightly more like YA or coming of age. How would I sell this to somebody who didn't go to school in India, but school is a universal concept and teen problems are pretty universal. So probably like lean more on that versus like the first book was more, oh, it's a South Asian inspired mythos rather than, oh, it's like a hero's quest, which is like a more universal language term. So I think, yeah, maybe, maybe more in marketing terms than in actual content terms, you can see an evolution. Okay, Shiv. I mean, you, you wrote a novel duology in India before you moved to the US, right? So, and um, what difference do you see in your writing then and your writing now? It's a hard question to answer because like one tends to be quite close to one's own work. Like the changes in one as a writer over a period of time, I feel is something that other observers are usually better placed to point out rather than yourself. But in terms of how one like sees the whole picture has definitely changed, especially since the time I, I wrote my novels, which was back in like 2012, 2013, those two novels came out. So, um, so it's, it's more like an understanding of what seems really obvious, but you kind of, at least I kind of had to learn it, which is good writing is good writing, no matter where you're writing it. And it will, and that's all you need to really worry about as opposed to, is this thing going to work in Indian market? Is this thing now has to be tweaked this way for Western market? And over a period of exposure, what I really learned is if you're writing a good story in a good book or a good novelette or whatever, it's, it's good. And you don't really need to have to worry about stuff like what the geography of the reader is when you're managing to do your job as a writer well enough. Okay, that is yeah. a great answer. Uh, yes, Samit. Uh, uh, yeah, I just want to, you know, I, I, I feel like I've probably over the last almost two decades, I've most pretty much most of, of my human social contact has been with other writers. I mean, most, most of my friends are writers. I've seen so many writers kind of, you know, start sometimes finish, uh, evolve as they grow. And under a very, very broad sort of, you know, classification of writers, I think all of us, and I say this with a with a certain amount of, with, with a great amount of confidence, all of the four of us are very clearly writers who are writing what we want to write fundamentally, or what we feel. Um, I mean, the, the urge is, is mostly internal and the decision sets about uh, how we're going to create the work is also internal. It's a very clearly visible thing from outside when you're looking at writer types because none of us are fundamentally people who are letting either market trends or the demands of an external producer essentially determine the core of the of the thing that we are doing. Um, so we are so while of course one one always tries to stay aware of of whatever the trend is or whatever the hot spaces are to write in or whatever in in a nebulous sense. Um, you know, audiences may want or not want for the category of writing that we are currently writing in. There is a very clear difference between um, between this side of the fence and the side of the fence that is essentially pulling their projects together from um, what the demands of the industry or the or the producer or the project are. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just that it's very hard to be both, and it it looks to me from the outside very clearly that all four of us are on um, the. Yeah, yeah. As so, in the ultimately, we write what we feel like. Thing we modify it according to whatever experience, intelligence, uh, demands of interaction, etc. But it's fundamentally self-started. That is also a great answer, Samit. And now we'll actually read from. So I asked Marco if we can read from 
Nemo and he said you can read from Samit's pilot a little bit and you can give the audience a taste of what's coming. So Samit, do you have the file? Like, will you start? I, I have nothing uh, because I am a whirlpool of, of chaos at the moment. So I am actually, I mean, if, if, if you have it with you, I'd be most happy if you read it or I mean, I mean, time wise, if you just like to do questions or chat for the rest of it, then because I, I mean, I don't know, I'm so I, I do do it. Does any of the others have the uh, I have Summit's pilot in front of us, so I can read a little bit from it because I had promised a reading and then we went a little over time. So. Um, OK, what can I OK, I'll, I'll just start then, right? Um, this is this is the pilot episode of season one, episode one of Nemo. It's called The Man in the Water and it's by Samit Basu. Starts in the Indian Ocean, 1859. An ordinary man would have been crushed under the pressure, but water has always been his friend. He wonders again if he is a sea god, but dismisses the notion as unscientific. He should not be here, but then neither should the city beneath him, his heart's home. All men of reason know that Kumari Kandam or Lemuria or Atlantis is but a sailor's legend, a metaphor, a dream. He hears words in the distance, words he knows, laughter, but that is impossible. There are shapes flowing in the water around him, spectral, alive. He senses them, they shimmer. He swims fast, easily, darting up towards the glimmer above him, not of light. It is far too deep for that, but above him lies darkness less infinite. Below the horned towers of Kumari Kandam settle again to their slumbers. So far from the sun. It is cold, so very cold. No man could survive in these depths, these depths. Mm. But he swims on, unstoppable, rising. He feels no cold. He breathes no air. There is no air here, not even in memory. And I will stop here because we are actually a little short on time and I will move on to the questions that we have, right? Mm, great. So I have a question from Snigta Somani. The question is, could you see yourself making a series out of this podcast where you pursue other novels? Samit, do you, do you want to do this treatment on other novels? Um, as in would, right, could you see yourself making a series out of this podcast where you pursue other novels? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, you know, it's of, of that. I, I realized I've also reached the point where the first thing I think of, uh, whenever questions like this come is the logistics of my current life situation. Um, I, I don't know if you guys also automatically spring into, okay. So I want to say yes to absolutely every project. Now, where do I fit it in? There is two hours on Wednesdays that I could possibly fit this into. Um, Theoretically, yes, yes to any interesting project has always been the the guideline. It would, yeah. Um, it it's an interesting format. This it's an interesting way of of, of treating any material. So if you have the right team and you have um the right life situation, I would recommend it strongly. Pachala, would you would you write another one of these for? I, I guess that's the question for another novel, another classic. I mean, why not? I think it's fun to like play around with content in that way. And I'm sorry, I call it content. It's just a, a occupational hazard. Um, yeah, I think it would be fun. And it's always like, I like mixing things up, like going back into older IP and like seeing what can you do with it or like shed a fresh light on it or updating it for like the times we are in. Um, so why not? What about Shiv? Well, sure. I mean, like some it's right. Like you don't really ever say I will not do this again and I will not take on future novel projects. Right. Like so. Yeah. I mean, one is always open to it. It also depends on like what the specifics are in that situation. Like as some said, it could be like life logistics. It could be as simple as are you as interested in. And this is not an example that actually exists. But are you as interested in doing a Robin Hood origin story as you are a Nemo origin story? So on and so forth. So, I mean. Yes, with the caveat that it always depends and on a case-to-case -case basis, right? 
So great, great. And I will I will actually add the technical answer that this project Nemo started as a, a production from Serial Box, which is now Realm. And uh, when it goes out, it will be called season one. So there's a possibility that if people read it, people love it, people buy it, we will write a season two. So that's a hint to all the people listening. And uh, yeah, so I mean, whether we'll do it from a you know, from Realm or from other places depends on those logistics, like who asks us to do these things, because usually, usually these mixed novels end up being, um, you know, commissions rather than our own writing. So, I mean, people have to commission us, which basically means that you guys need to read this. Um, second question from Tadi again. Um, in a collaborative sense, were these were there ideas you had to abandon individually that you still think should have been in the finished narrative? Is this man trying to cause war? Um, I can. I, I'd like to jump in on that. I would assume that is absolutely. There are several of these ideas for all of us. Like I would, I would be deeply surprised if any of us did not were not thinking that, you know this project is fine, maybe it's whatever, hopefully it's good. But if we had done these three things that I have, then it would have been everything. And it would be one stunning masterwork, uh, masterwork to put in the Mount Rushmore of such projects. And that's another interesting four voices in different directions thing. Anyway, so so yes, um, there, there were ideas you had that all of us, I suspect, uh, please confirm or deny as you go, um, that, that we, that we had to abandon uh, that would we feel uh, uh, made supremely better and that is the price you pay for uh, collaborative collaborator work and especially work that is company owned uh, you I mean, for, for me that has been like yeah sorry yeah, that, that has been also learning the format a lot because i wrote a few slow paragraphs like slow beautiful paragraphs that i really like which are not going there because those those paragraphs work well as prose, they don't work very well in the podcast format. So you know, our editor Marco read them, and he was like, "These are nice paragraphs, but they will not work." And I was so heartbroken. But yes, those are going away. So Achala, Shiv. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think that like the whole thing of kill your darlings is so much truer of screenwriting and like writing for performance than it is in prose. And I'm sure there's gonna, I mean, I still, like, I don't know what the final look of my chapters is gonna be, but I'm sure there's gonna be parts where I'm like, oh, I thought that was like a really cool turn of phrase. And I'll just be told it's not gonna read well, you know, like that's that's just as bald as it gets. Um, so I think maybe just like the, the technical aspect of this kind of writing is what leads to a lot of abandoning stuff that you thought was cool rather than ideas, you know, because I mean, personally, at least I don't think there's been any idea that I'm like, I want this in and people have said no. Um, I think it's gonna be more the style part of it. Okay, great, great answers. I will pick one question which is easier to answer because we're running out of time. And this is, do you read fan fiction and any favorites? Can I can I go? Um, I yeah, yeah. love fan fiction. I have been reading it since I was like twelve years old and had access to the internet. Um, my chosen fandom is uh, to read fan fiction is Harry Potter because honestly, I think there are writers out there who have done far more interesting things with that world than J.K. Rowling has. Um, and my favorite of all time is the Shoebox Project, which is a Marauders era fic. And if you have not read it, Please go read it. It's amazing. Samit, do you want to go on? Like talk yeah, sure. about. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not. I'm not super uh, caught up on fan fiction at all. It's it's always been one of those universes where I I feel like I should I should read all the fan fiction. Um, but I've never gotten around to it because I've just been struggling trying to catch up with. Oh. Oh, we've lost him, but he he'll probably be back. Let's okay. Right. Let's um, go on with oh, yeah, you. So yeah, let's. Uh, I'm. I'm not. I'm not a fan fiction expert, but I aim to be. I mean, I. I grew up reading. You know, I grew up reading um a lot of Harry Potter fan fiction, and one of my close friends used to be very active in the Harry Potter fandom. Like, you know, Achala, you may have even seen her and not known because she she didn't talk about being Indian, but she was very active, very active writer. 
so i just like kind of followed in her coattails and you know read fan fiction whatever she um recommended to me like this is my this friend is the person who has com completely led me into fan fiction all the time i am not a very independent reader and so currently i am reading fan fiction of i mean chinese tv shows okay chinese fantasy shows including there's a show called untamed which is on netflix these days and i mean so i i am discovering chinese fantasy and i i had no idea that there was such a huge huge fantasy scene in china and there's a lot of english fan fiction of that so that that is something that i am reading for fan fiction shiv do you have a fan fiction comment I don't honestly get time to read a lot of it. I'm kind of in Summit's boat where I try when I can, but not a lot of the time. Like one thing I've enjoyed in pieces in the past is the shoebox project, but um, I can't really like claim that I'm some kind of expert who can give you some speech about what good is and what is great and what I should recommend and that sort of thing. Great. So we have one question, one more question, which is a slightly more general question. Um, it says, "What does the future hold for science fiction literature? And do you think science fiction will maintain its independence or intertwine with other literary genres?" Isn't it already intertwining with other literary genres all the time? Like, I feel like. Sorry, I'm just gonna go. Um, <laughs> uh like this whole concept of like siloing genres that this is science fiction and this is like science fiction and fantasy stopped being separate genres like back in the 70s when star wars came out so i mean um this con like genres have been melding since writing has existed and marketers decided to find genres in which to put books to you know push them to audiences so and as for what the future holds i think very very exciting things like we're pretty much i think this is something that is said very often in circles but i don't know how commonly it's said which is that we are pretty much in a golden age of science fiction and fantasy writing at this point of time in the world so as someone in the field i'm super excited about what it holds when i i am way more excited about the field now than when i was a teenager where where i actually did not actively participate in the science fiction scene because i didn't think it was that fun like the community itself i didn't think it was that fun currently i think the community is like the best that i have ever seen so yeah uh sure um in terms of closing remarks it was it was actually excellent to see all of you guys and it was a pleasure to do this my my remarks are closed i will answer this question very quickly um i think the future for science fiction is is excellent i think it is already um it's already more exciting than it's ever been and it's only going to going to get better and better i as shiv said i think it's always been intertwined with other literary genres and this whole classification of genres is a was a bit of a mistake from the beginning and continues to be one and um, you know everyone just reads the books that, that they like and picks up the next one uh, based on some recommendation process they have so it's all good basically great achala yeah i think the future of sci-fi fantasy is very bright because all the people with money are finally paying attention thanks to like lord of the rings and harry potter and game of thrones and marvel cinematic universe of course which is technically science fiction fantasy um so i think because finally people are listening and the people who can make really great stuff sorry i live on a very busy road um because they're all listening there's more investment in actually finding talent who can write really great science fiction fantasy and it's coming from all over the place all over the world all sorts of voices so yeah the future is bright um and i hope all of you <laughs> enjoy uh nemo and tune in when it comes out yeah thank you so much achila that was actually a great closing remark and we're actually over time which i'm i'm very glad about because i kept thinking we wouldn't have enough to talk about and i kept thinking one of us would blink out or our internet would blink out but you know shiv also can manage to come back quickly so yeah this has been a great panel thanks for being here to the authors and thanks for being here to the audience is it's been great and hope you have a great rest of the night hope you have a great day samit you, you're Thank on you. like saturday you're in saturday morning right great yeah. day and bye bye